It's wonderful to be with you this morning. Uh, at home it's already afternoon, so <laughs> I have to adjust. I always enjoy coming to Korea. Uh, it's such a wonderful, blessed nation. Each time I come, I, I am more impressed with the challenges that you've faced over the last 50, 60 years and the way that you've embraced them and the consequence of that and what God has done in this, this wonderful nation. Um, and yet I see also that you're facing many challenges um, as a new, the next generation begins to take its place. And uh, there, are, there are many challenges that you face, but it's always a joy to come and join with you. So thank you for this opportunity. Um, I've worked with Youth with a Mission, YWAM, since 1980. And a few years ago, I've worked, I've worked mainly with the University of the Nations. So it's been a, it's, um, a number of years ago, I was asked to take on the role as the International Dean for the uh, College of Education for Youth with a Missions, University of the Nations, uh, which I, after much uh, prayer, agreed to do. Now, in Youth with a Mission, uh, there are many schools that we have around the world that were started for many different reasons. Uh, the, for instance, in Uganda, we have schools that were started because the aid, children of AIDS parents and children with AIDS are not able to go to the normal schools. And so schools were started to meet that need. Uh, in, uh, in Denmark, uh, for many years, similar to my, my fr um, colleague here, <laughs> Um, as he was sharing about Christian education, uh, that all of their schools were state schools with a Christian emphasis, but it was not necessarily a Christian education. So Youth with a Mission, a number of years ago, pioneered a Christian school, uh, about 20 or more years ago. And it was pioneered as the first Christian school in the nation for many, many years, centuries even. And uh, it now is a leading school in the nation, and there are many other Christian schools that have been developed since then, but they pioneered that and went through all the legal ways of bringing that about. Uh, and so we have, we have many uh, varieties of schools and many reasons that schools were started. And so my challenge as the Dean of Education was to say, how do I help all of them to develop? How do we have a standard that works in Uganda with uh, poor schools and poor communities for victims of AIDS? And how does it work in Denmark, a, a very modern Western society? How do we create a, a standard for that? How do we create that? And that really has been the challenge that um, we were faced with as we started Global Accreditation Association. And part of why I got involved was because I want to see all of these schools offer the best education to the young people that they're involved with, just as we've heard so passionately beforehand. There is a, a difference between Christian education and secular education. And I believe every child has the right to the option <laughs> of Christian education. So GAA was established with that in mind. Um, as well as that, it's also created for the ability of Christian schools to exist where accreditation is required. For instance, in Indonesia, we have a school in West Papua that comes under all sorts of re restrictions that it would not have the same level of restriction if it was accredited from an outside agency as well as within the government system. There is also such a need, as we have heard again so passionately, there is a difference between Christian education and secular education. But, but what is that difference? What does it look like? So what we have done is tried to de define a, a, a benchmark for Christian education that will work in every culture. And uh, did I do that? No? I'm not sure, this is not being very obedient to me. Am I? No, we're going back even further. <laughs> okay, I think we're right. <laughs> um, so as we, um, we, we wanted to create this benchmark that would work in every culture and every community and in every school that we're a part of. And then we wanted to create an, a, a way of helping schools to at attain that benchmark and to um, see that the schools develop. Uh, now, 
as I've uh, done, I've studied education um, in lots of different contexts, but the more I've studied is I've looked at the difference between the liberal model of education, which is most of what our system is based on, or the Greek model of education, and compared it with the Hebrew or Jewish model of education, there are, there are great differences. And the, the liberal model is much more about training the mind, whereas the Hebrew model was about training the person. And so, as um, we've de de defined, what is it that we're called to do as Christian educators? The aim of Greek education and through the, in, into the Enlightenment was to create an educated person. But Jesus did not say to go into all the nations of the world and go into all the world and educate the nations. He told us to go into all the world and disciple the nations. And so I would like to suggest that the word that best describes Christian education is discipleship. And that's what we've tried to say is how do we disciple children? What does that look like? And, and, and as opposed to just educating them. So that the children of the next of this current generation can take their place and change society around the world. Now one of the challenges we face is how to define that um, the difference between discipleship and just education. How do, how do you define that difference? And that's what we've attempted to do. Now I speak for over a week on these differences, so I don't expect that uh, we will cover them in probably another 10 minutes. <laughs> so, um, but I have given them to you just to give you some of the differences, and then I will speak about one. In education, when it is the goal, it is elitist and it's exclusive, based on the, the Greek system. It was about, in the Greeks were, and the Enlightenment, was about creating an elite leader. However, discipleship is about inclusion. It's about including everyone and helping them to understand who they are and who, what they are called to, and then equipping them for the call of God on their life as a disciple of the Lord Jesus for the rest of their life. Now, I will not go through the rest of these, but I do want to focus on one. I'd like to focus on the difference between worldly wisdom, which is what the liberal model of education develops, and godly wisdom, which the, the Bible defines. Now, in worldly wisdom, we start with knowledge. And as you gain more and more knowledge, you begin to grow in your understanding of the subject matter. And as you grow in your understanding and have studied something for many years, you eventually become wise and everyone asks your opinion because you are wise. So there's this progression from knowledge to understanding to wisdom. And I think that's quite alluring. <laughs> it makes me good, feel good to think the more I know, the more I understand and the more wise I become. But actually, that's not what the Bible says wisdom is. In James 1.5, it says, If anyone lacks wisdom, he should ask God. He should not go to university. He should not study for 50 years. But he should ask God. And what is the, this is a remarkable scripture because it says, Then God gives generously to all without finding fault. And it will be given to him. It's an incredible scripture. So wisdom doesn't come from much study. It comes from God. And we are told in Proverbs that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Now I've pondered this for many years. Why is the fear of the Lord the beginning of wisdom? My conclusion is this. That if I fear God, I will ask his opinion. If I don't fear God... I will rely on my own. And fearing God and asking his opinion gives me the potential to become wise. So I believe the foundation of our Christian education system has to be to teach children to fear God. That is the fa that's the first step before they can become wise. The next step is also in the scripture in Proverbs 9.10 where it says, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. 
and the knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. So I would like to suggest that understanding doesn't come from the acquisition of lots of knowledge. Understanding comes from the knowledge of the one who created everything. A knowledge of who God is. How he functions on earth. How he, how he created the earth. And how he works amongst his people. What his nature and character is. And what that looks like as he functions on earth. It says here that the knowledge of the Holy One, that is what understanding is. That is true understanding. And then I'd like to finish with a third scripture in looking at what biblical wisdom is. No? In Proverbs 24, 3 and 4, we're told that by wisdom the house is built. For me, that means as we, as we teach children to fear God and seek his opinion, that begins to lay the foundation. And the house has begun to be built. But it's through understanding that it's established. It's by understanding who God is and what he's like, how he functions on earth. And then fastly it says, when that foundation is laid in a child's life or in anyone's life, the house, the rooms of the house are filled with rare and beautiful treasures, which is knowledge. Knowledge only has meaning as it fills a house or a child's house that understands the fear of God and understands who he is. And I believe that's the foundation of Christian education. As we have looked at a standard for GAA, what relevance does this have to GAA? As we have looked at a standard this is what we have used. We've said, how do we define this? What, what principles can we use? And then we've gone to the Bible and we have come up with 89 principles, educational principles, that are based on describing this model of education, discipleship education. I'd like to thank you for your time. And it's been great to be with you. And I'm looking forward to meeting more of you as we go through the day. Thank you. <laughs>